Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. We've got a special guest tonight. Uh, and, and, on the one hand, he's not a convert. He's not even a revert, I don't think. I don't think he ever budged from his faith. But he has a story to tell, and that's why we've invited Dr. Matthew Bunsen to join us. Now, those of you who are regular EWTN viewers are familiar with Matt. Uh, he's the senior contributor for EWTN. Um, he's a senior editor for the National Catholic Register. He's an author of a gazillion books, 54 <laughs> books, uh, including the Cyclopedia of uh, American Catholic History. And, uh, but I've known him for a long time when he was an editor of another magazine that I wrote for once in a while. Yeah, hey, Matt, was... welcome. Good to be with you. It's a, it's a genuine privilege. And, and you're right, I, I'm a cradle Catholic, <laughs> but uh, great roots in conversion. And I always say that uh, my, my personal conversion is an ongoing project right. that, that's for all of us. Well, you know, uh, I was a pastor before I converted, and there was a, um, a, a history of something called PKs, mm -hmm. pastor's kids, and they're not always the best mm -hmm. models of their parents. I happen to have three absolutely perfect sons, so I mean, uh, and my all my sons uh, followed us into the church. But you're kind of a convert kid, yes, right? I am. A CK, if you will. <laughs> and yes. so the, the issue is, how'd you catch it and lived it out? Mm -hmm. And I'd love to have you sitting there with my oldest son, John Marcus. He came in, he was no, he, he just barely the same thing like you. Well, your parents uh, converted long before. But I'm going to be back out because that's where we're going to begin. Yes. Is you're going to talk about their unique journeys. Right? Well, both my parents were converts. And so I am blessed. Uh, usually... Uh, there's one who comes in, and, and maybe one was yeah. a Catholic. Yeah. In my case, uh, both my parents were converts in 1948, wow. but they did not meet until 1960. So they both had these <laughs> incredible adventures that brought them into the faith, and then lived the faith for a while, and then met. And uh, that, I think, was a, one of those journeys that both of them, well, they would talk about it. My mom especially, my dad, because he was ill, uh, just by way of some background, my, my father died of Huntington's disease. Uh, and so we were taking care of him for many years, and the same disease that took my brother as well. But looking back on that, you realize how important, how central the faith was mm -hmm. in getting you through all of those times. And my mom in particular as a convert uh, who was raised Episcopalian. My father uh, grew up uh, in Judaism. Mm -hmm. So two very different backgrounds. My mom in Chicago, my, my dad from the Boston area. You know, I... Many of us today who have, because of the media, we get this impression that we're living in this time of a great tsunami of converts. It was almost like it's a new phenomenon that never <laughs> happened yes. before. And, you know, I've looked at the data in our work with the Coming Home Network. We've seen the data, and the truth is, yes, at least it seems there are more today, but in some day, ways I think it's more that, that we know more about them today because there's always been a stream. It's not been a tsunami. It's not been a, a, a Mississippi River of converts. There's always been a stream. And so your parents represent that stream. They do. But also it's exciting to think about when they converted. I mean, your dad, a former Jew, in the 40s. Mm -hmm. In the military, and and that so I mean we can even yeah. start there. I'd love where to hear, my yeah. dad grew up in the Boston area, and uh, enlisted right after Pearl Harbor, so in 1941, and uh, he was I was told that he was technically a little young to to go into the military, but they looked the other way because of the incredible circumstances, yeah, the, yeah. the horrifying circumstances of of the start of the World War II for America. Yeah. And uh, they gave him tests, and uh, what they discovered is that he was somebody, even though he had just graduated high school, had no college experience, but who was so intelligent uh, <laughs> that they sent him to OCS, Officer Candidate School. And he became an officer in the, the Army Medical Service Corps. That's important because of two things. Um, in the Army Medical Service Corps, he served in Europe, uh, followed uh, General George Patton's Third Army, as he put it, cleaning up, you know, old blood and guts, I think was, was the title that they, they had for, for Patton. My dad was in the 7th Army, which is uh, General Patch. 
And part of his task was he was one of the very first of the medical troops to enter into Dachau concentration camp. Let me ask something. When he, when he enlisted after Pearl Harbor and got, finally we got into it, did they know yet what was going on in Germany? No, I mean, they knew that uh, Adolf Hitler was a monster, that Nazism was horrendous. I think as the war unfolded and as they fought their way across Europe and then into Germany, the, the full brunt of the evil that they were confronting became much more manifest. And I was told stories. My dad almost never talked about his experiences in that My dad out. didn't either, you know? It, he just uh, wouldn't. Uh, so most of the details that I learned were from friends of his who'd uh, come to Hawaii, which is where we were living, uh, after yeah. my dad left the Army uh, around 1970 because of the, the Huntington's disease. And they would tell me stories about uh, some of the things that my dad did. Wow. And I was told, and it's my understanding, that he received every medal except for the Congressional Medal of Honor because it was a, he had a remarkable career, 28 years. He served in World War II, two tours in Korea, two tours in Vietnam, and then, of course, had the disease. Wow. His experiences in Dachau, I think, also brought him more and more into contact with the chaplains, the Catholic chaplains who were serving uh, in World War II. And he was told that if you have a serious problem that you need to deal with spiritually, emotionally, go to the Catholic chaplains. Don't go to anyone else because they're the real deal, is, is what he was told. That uh, they knew their stuff, but they also were very straightforward in, in helping you find solutions. And, and, they, and the joke was that they're not going to try to convert you. They're here for you. Yeah. And that experience was a profound one for him. And it was because of their example uh, that in 1948, uh, he became Catholic. Wow. Well, today, it seems like there's a lot of pressure on the chaplains to be very ecumenical. Yes. I don't think that was true back in their day. He may have been trying to convert him, but he was straight. The chaplains, I'm guessing, were straight with the faith. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, absolutely solid. And that was the thing that uh, attracted my dad as well, that the clarity of what they were, the advice they were giving, the strength of their character, but also the fact that these were incredibly prayerful men, uh, that they yeah. helped you to deal with crises, uh, but then also they had that way of leading you into the deeper questions and then to answer those questions that you had with, with great clarity. Was your dad, and again, I don't know how much you talked about his actual spiritual journey, yeah. but was, was that coming into the church um, uh, also parallel to a conversion to God for him? Because many Jews, you know, unfortunately don't have a faith. Uh, depending on their tradition they've come from. Yes, well, of course, in the post-war era, uh, there was the, the, the serious question about how God would allow this to happen uh, to the Jewish people. And uh, that was a, a, a stern, difficult question that a lot of my dad's friends and some of his relatives faced as well. And, and some of them, uh, we lost touch with them many, many years ago, but, but uh, quite a few of them uh, reached the conclusion that uh, I can't love a God who would allow this to happen. Yeah. But my dad, in his conversations with the chaplains, uh, with the redemptive aspect of suffering that he saw, uh, understood, you know, there's a deeper meaning here. And I think that was one of the things that really drew him to the Catholic faith. And the stability of the order that the church provided. My dad was uh, very structured. He was, he was superbly disciplined. And I think he appreciated the discipline of the chaplains, but also the structure and clarity, to use that word again, of the faith. Of, of a faith life that allows you to have joy and happiness, but also that structure, discipline, and a way of leading your life that is authentically free, uh, but that is also very disciplined. And, and he appreciated all of that. Yeah, I, I've heard from a number of Jewish converts that one aspect of Catholicism, Christianity, that was a new aspect of the faith was this really emphasis on forgiving others, mm -hmm. forgiving others, like our Lord says from the Lord, they don't know what they're doing. And mm -hmm. so though, I mean, I'm not a, a former Jew, so I don't, yeah. uh, I, I'm gonna be careful talking about that absolutely horrendous time, but also at some point getting to the point of saying the German folk in general did not understand what they were drawn into and mm -hmm. the horrendousness of that. Yeah, well, in the post-war era, uh, he was already uh, a rapidly advancing officer. Uh, he was based in uh, Stuttgart, 
uh, which is actually where I was born. <laughs> and so by that point, uh, he was married to my mom. And my, my brother was here, and I was born in Germany. And one of his tasks was sort of the denazification of that part of the world. Now, if you know anything about German history, about Nazi history, you know that the, the Nazi party essentially began in many ways in Bavaria, uh, in Munich. And that was part of the concern that they had uh, in helping the people of that region uh, to move beyond to, to be purified of sort of the Nazi terror and the, the racism and the, the evil uh, that Nazism represented. So my dad always joked that uh, after the, the fall of Nazi Germany, he said, you couldn't find any Nazis. It's, it's, you know, they, they would joke that they'd say, well, we heard that there were some Nazis here. but we <laughs> And of course, they, they would have their identification papers. Well, you were a member of the party. But his, his point was that Part of it is helping people to confront the truth in their lives, uh, but then also to deal with how, how are you going to repair that? Yeah. What kind of penance are you going to do? And I think that was something that he appreciated very much uh, coming into the church. Yeah, the Catholic Church began with Peter, who messed up royally, <laughs> but yes. was able to be forgiven and move forward and become a leader. You know, and that's the message that uh, that we have to look at those people that did horrendous things during that war to give them a chance of, you know, to move forward in Christ. Yeah, I think my dad also appreciated the, the balance that we have in, in the Catholic faith of mercy and justice, yeah. that the two go together. And I think that was uh, one of the things that my mom appreciated. Now, all of this is happening for my dad. And do you remember the uh, the Pathé news, the, yeah. the, the the news updates, the, the, yeah. the film reels that you'd have between like Laurel and Hardy films or, <laughs> or Abbott and Costello films, and and then you'd have Pathé news with the, the the sound that you can once you hear the Pathé news, you know what you're hearing. My mom in uh, 1945, she was about 15 years old, was watching uh, uh, I think it was an Abbott and Costello double feature, and there was one of these news reels from Germany that <laughs> concentration camp liberated, which he did not know at the time. She was a 15-year-old girl. She was actually watching her future husband. Somewhere in one of those films wow. was medical troops, American medical troops, in the concentration camps. And unbeknownst to her, she was watching her future husband. And it's, it's one of those little things of history that I love because <laughs> it was right three years after that, in the, the, actually the winter of 1947, that she was in Chicago on Michigan Avenue, and she was walking in a snowstorm, and she kicked something. She, she told me this story many times over the years. She, she was walking in the snow, and she, she kicked a book, and it went flying, and she had no idea what it was, so she searched around in the snow and found this book, and she tucked it, walked away, opened it up, and sure enough, it was a Baltimore Catechism. And she began reading it, the, the first questions, of course, and, and the big questions. Was she an active Episcopalian before? Uh, her family, uh, they were Episcopalians, but um, not in any way to be uncharitable. But I think they were more anti-Catholics than they were Episcopalians. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very cultural thing. And I know that that was a common uh, way of looking at a lot of things at the time. Uh, they weren't particularly active. Uh, her father was a Lutheran, uh, Swedish. Uh, and uh, one of the greatest singers I've ever heard, and would, could have been a professional baseball player, uh, but his family objected to him playing baseball on Sundays, so he, he gave up the career. Good Lutheran. Good Lutheran. Our guest is Dr. Matthew Bunsen, for those of you on radio. So when she finds this book in the snow, she kicks, so she realizes it's Catholic, <laughs> so she's drawn to it to see what those others, I mean, did she have kind of this anti-Catholic slant as she opened no, it up? No, she was uh, always very open to wow. the idea of, uh, of knowledge, of truth. And it came right at that time when she was herself asking the big questions in life. You know, who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? And she knew that there was always something not quite yeah. right about the sort of anti-Catholicism that she saw, that, that sort of quiet anti-Catholic bigotry. Uh, that is, has been so much a part of American Catholic history. Mm -hmm. And so she hid the book from her parents. And uh, she slowly was reading through this book, but then uh, she was in, back in the day, you had uh, the, the old pharmacies, uh, uh, the 
places where you could go where they had a soda fountain. Oh, of course. And there was phosphates. A, a phosphates. Phosphates. And a, a Jewish before. owner of one of the, the pharmacies where she'd go, and they had the, the soda counter. And in the winter, he would give her hot chocolate, and in the summer, he would give her chocolate shakes because he liked her, and she was very kind to him. And so he was watching her later that winter, and he said to her that someone left a book behind. And he said, I've noticed that you've been reading this one particular book a lot here in the corner. He says, I think you were meant to have this. And it was a breviary. So, so over the next few months, uh, through the early part of 1948, she gradually accumulated this small Catholic library to no effort on her part. People would give her books. She'd find books and didn't have an owner. It would just miraculously appear. And she was reading her way into Catholicism. But she knew she had to wait until she turned 18 because she knew the reaction. And so on her 18th birthday, she informed her parents that she was becoming Catholic. And she revealed that she had all of these books that, that had just begun to accumulate around her. And their reaction was pretty much exactly what she thought. They, they mm. were not very happy, and they actually threw her out of the house. Whoa. And it, oh. was, it was a very difficult time mm. for her. Mm. Well, she, you said it was 1960 or so? Uh, 1948. 19, that's 48 for her. Yeah, okay. so she had gotcha. just turned 18. And so she actually had to leave Chicago for a while uh, and went to Indianapolis uh, with some help of, uh, from some friends. And over time, her parents accepted the fact that uh, she was not going to abandon this idea. Uh, they were firmly convinced that you had to be insane uh, to become Catholic, yeah. especially in, in their world. And I, I understand that. I, it, everyone they knew was Episcopalian or Lutheran, they, they just did not know very many Catholics. Did she ever talk to you about what, if there was anything specific that she had picked up in the Baltimore Catechism, the breviary that gave her the mandate to make this big move? Part of it was the why we were made, you know, to mm -hmm. know and love God and to be with him in the next, in, in this life and to be with him in the next. That, I think, was her first stepping stone. But then it was authority in the church, it was the sacraments in the church, but then there was also the, the aspect of, of prayer life. Mm. And the breviary, I think, was perfectly timed because here, here she was getting this sort of foundation from the Baltimore Catechism in the sacraments and other things. But then in the breviary, she was opening herself up to that connection between scripture and prayer in, in the Catholic tradition. And I think she fell in love with doing daily prayer. Uh, that she was not really, it was not something that she ever did uh, as an Episcopalian. Now, now this is 48. So she came in in 48. When did your dad come in? 1948. Both around the same time. Both around the same time. He's elsewhere. He, by that point, he was being shipped, starting to be shipped off uh, to uh, Asia uh, to help run MASH units. And then, of course, he had two tours in Korea. So all of that was happening in, during the Korean was he during, War. Was he in Germany during Nuremberg? Uh, he was uh, part of, uh, not part of the trial, but the, he was based in Germany during yeah. that, yes. Okay. I mean, well, at the time, uh, I imagine for him, I'm Jewish, to be facing all that. Yes, exactly. That but the other thing that I wanted to point out, you know, we talk about this long trajectory of conversion. Today's, quote, tsunami of converts is after Vatican II, <laughs> after vernacular, after all this stuff. They're in Latin mass time. Yes. Did either of them know Latin? No. <laughs> and my mom adored the Latin Mass. She, she loved uh, the Mass. And once she began going, uh, she realized that the, the beauty of the liturgy, uh, and she also loved the fact that you could go anywhere, anywhere on the face of the earth, and you could go to the Mass, and you could, you'd understand it. So one of the things that she did was to start, she began learning Latin as best she could. It was breviary. I was wondering about the breviary. It was, was almost completely in Latin. Sure. So she began mastering uh, Latin as well. Uh, never really liked it very much in, in terms of mastering it, but, but she got there <laughs> and understood why uh, you had that stability of, of the Latin. Mm. And then uh, came in and through a series of adventures, uh, went to Mary Grove, uh, and that's where she studied. I think it was in Detroit, uh, where she uh, studied with nuns and developed more of an appreciation for the faith, especially philosophy. 
uh, the, 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 the beautiful way of, of combining faith and reason in Thomas Aquinas. Mm. Uh, and she studied Aristotle and began to appreciate the great philosophy of, of Aquinas, appreciated Thomism, and that gave her even more of a, of a grounding uh, in the church and then went to work for the church. So she went on from there to work in New Orleans for the archdiocese and the newspaper and then as a kind of assistant to Archbishop Rummel, uh, who said to her one of the, uh, uh, the, the lines that she always quoted, and it's very apropos to where we are today, and that someone asked Archbishop Rummel, uh, what is the greatest uh, proof of the divinity of the Catholic Church? And he said, the idiots who run her. <laughs> And she, I hate she, to laugh about that. But it, well, as somebody who spent yeah. many decades that followed in chancery offices, she saw it very up close. Yeah. And so she, she worked for Archbishop uh, Emmett, Robert Emmett Lucy in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And it was at a party that she was invited to of officers at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. She was not a particularly social person. She wasn't looking to get married. She was still trying to discover what it was exactly that God wanted her to do in her life and she wanted to be obedient to the will of God. So she Which was I'm wondering that she's single at this point. Yes, she is. So yeah. around 60 she's 20, right? Well, uh, she was born in 1930, so she was she was she's pushing 30. yeah, she she's was pushing 30. 30. Yeah, my yeah. mother was born in 32. So yeah. Um, and so she went to this she goes to this she could have been discerning religious life. She actually uh, very seriously considered it uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, she very, looked very seriously at the, the Carmelites. And speaking personally, I'm glad that she uh, <laughs> was called to something else. Uh, so she left that uh, and then began a series of jobs. And she went to this party of officers and uh, she had no expectations of it. She, thought that, she didn't think they'd be very interesting. She always talked about the fact that she walked into this room, it was packed with soldiers as a party of officers at Fort Sam Houston in Texas would be. And she said she saw a man across the room and it was as though someone said to her in her ear, you will marry him. And so they met in 1960 and, and married the next year. And then the following year, uh, my brother was born. And they thought it was very interesting that they had both been converted in, in 1948. Yeah. And so they, they had these parallel experiences, but the two of them I think were perfectly matched because my mom had studied the faith uh, more intensely than my dad. My dad was a man of, of action. Yep. He was a man of discipline. Uh, he was not somebody who was particularly obsessed or taken up with uh, theology. He just loved being Catholic and he loved the faith. Whereas my mom, working in chanceries and, and dealing with canon lawyers and theologians and others, uh, she really enjoyed getting into the meat of what the church was actually teaching and believing. So they're married in 60. Uh, so the early days of their marriage are a very interesting time in the church. You yes. Know, you know, St. John the 23rd announces there's going to be a big change coming up. That's right. And my dad is transferred from Texas back to Germany. And it was right around the time of the council. So we were living in, in Germany from, I think, like 1963 or 64 to around 1967. During the whole the, council? The whole, no, the, almost the whole council. The yes, council? Wow. yes. And wow. so she, as a result of working for the church in Germany as well, on the base in Stuttgart, mm. And, and around the area around Garmisch Partenkirchen. So they, they went, for example, to Oberammergau uh, for the Passion Play and, and all of that. She developed a lot of friendships with theologians and priests. And uh, actually in our house, I was a, a baby at the time, but she actually uh, had for dinner uh, Karl Rahner at our dining room table. So I realized that the odds are pretty good that it's a baby. I probably spit up on him or something like that, but it's... it's that's the reason. <laughs> that's the reason. It went off the rails from that point. But part of it was she was able to see the impact of the council on the ground level mm -hmm. because she helped run uh, a lot of the base and helped the chaplain on the base uh, to deal with the changes that were coming mm -hmm. and to help people understand some of the context of the council. And that made her, in the years that followed, especially after we, my dad was sent to Vietnam from, from there, 
to oh, wow. deal with MASH units there. So he used to actually run, like the TV show, hmm. MASH, uh, he would run actual MASH units, which is, uh, he would say from time to time, they were crazier in real life than you could <laughs> ever see on the show. <laughs> My mom asked, uh, when we left Germany, how can, where are we going to be transferred? And they said, well, where, where are you going to live? And they said, well, you know, there's base housing pretty much anywhere. So she said, how about Hawaii? And it was close enough to Vietnam yeah. that it would be yeah. an easier trip back for my dad when he had leave. But also, there was just something told her, much as she was told, you will marry this person. She knew we had to move to Hawaii. And part of it was because she had developed such an appreciation for St. Damien of Molokai. Now, he was not a saint at the time, and he wasn't even beatified at the time. But this great example of a saint drew her uh, to the Hawaiian Islands. So that's where we were. But it was also, at that time, we're moving into the implementation of the council. And she's working for the Diocese of Honolulu in a very confused and difficult time. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, of course, I wasn't even... Uh, with thinking of the Catholic Church at the time, but I've often wondered not only so many of the changes, but the very change when, uh, when the priest turned around. I always figured, looking back, that that would have been the most startling difference, besides the vernacular, of course. It was certainly jarring uh, yeah. liturgically. But I think for her, uh, the biggest difficulty was the misrepresentation of the council uh, that she yeah. would see on the part of various people who were already trying to apply the idea of the spirit of the council. Uh, and she said, no, this is, read the council documents. And the thing that she consistently discovered was that those people who were saying the most strange things about the interpretation of the council were the ones who had almost never read any of the actual documents. They were just sort of making it up as they went, or they had heard somebody had told them, well, this is what it says. For example, uh, the idea that, that circulated very briefly in the 1970s that Mary was no longer important in the life of the church. Yeah. And instead... And her, her, any devotion to her was being eliminated from the masses. Yes, right? and, and it's every, devotion to the Blessed Mother is old-fashioned. Uh, the Pope doesn't want it, when in fact, if you read the life and writings of Pope St. Paul VI, he was a, devoted to the Blessed yeah. Mother. And including her in the eighth chapter, I think, of Lumen Gentium, as they did, it was to give her this particular place of honor instead of her own document, because they wanted her to be part of the church, to, that we always remember that. And that was one of my mom's points, uh, when you'd have these parish events or diocesan events, and you'd have these speakers saying these things, and she would ask them to point out where in the documents, where in Lumen Gentium does it say that the Blessed Mother is no longer important in the life of the church? And of course they couldn't. But many of them hadn't even read Lumen Gentium, <laughs> let alone chapter 8. While we pause here, when we come back, uh, the first thing I want to ask you is, okay, now you're a child of this conversion. Yeah. How did you catch Catholicism yourself? So we'll, we'll get that when we get back. And uh, for those of you watching, before we take a break, if you've got a story like, like Matt or like his folks that you'd love to share, please contact us at the Coming Home Network, chnetwork.org. We'd love to hear your story. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and uh, our guest is Dr. Matt uh, Munson. And uh, they distracted during, during the, the break. Matt, um, let's talk about you now. Yes. We've heard about the wonderful stories of your parents mm -hmm. coming in, all right? And uh, so you're unique in the sense of two convert parents that converted separate. And the Lord brought them together. I love it's about your mother. It's like the, you see the work of grace for yes. her recognizing, no, this is of the Lord. This is of the Lord. That's a gift yes, to recognize that. It is. How did that transfer to you? In a couple of ways. First, uh, my mom was working for the Diocese of Honolulu. So I also literally grew up in a chancery office in, in, <laughs> in Honolulu. And one of the great family friends that we had was uh, uh, Bishop uh, John Scanlon who was a bishop of Honolulu for many years, uh, during my most formative period. 
And so I was, uh, as you might imagine, somewhat bookish <laughs> as a child. And You got uh, that for your mother a little bit. I think so, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my brother was actually much smarter than I am. Uh, but I loved uh, reading through the books at the Chancery Office. Because I, once you begin to appreciate that, okay, this is probably a little beyond my comprehension at the moment, <laughs> I start with the basics. And, and my mom was always encouraging in that. But it was that, uh, but also seeing the church up close where you develop a certain real world appreciation of the fact that we have the beauty of the Catholic faith, but, but it's, there are so many imperfect instruments, myself included, uh, and that the beauty of the church with such flawed people in it, and <laughs> it, it's that reality that you can appreciate as a, as a child. So it. It, I wouldn't say that it inoculated me uh, from the scandals that followed. They're, they're horrifying and disturbing. But you also appreciate the importance of penance, of, mm. of that mercy, but also of justice. And so that was sort of a real world understanding of, of the faith. And Bishop Scanlon helped with that too. I mean, he was from Ireland. Uh, he had seen much in his youth of the occupation of Ireland and, and coming out from that. Uh, but then there was also just the lived daily faith. You know, something struck my mind. I don't know if it's the same Scanlon, but there's an awful lot of imprimaturs by a, a Bishop Scanlon in a lot of the older books. Uh, that wouldn't surprise I me I wonder if that's yeah. him. I remember that, wait a second, I remember seeing that name a lot. In, uh, but it also made me think about your being brought up at a time when catechesis was in an upheaval. <laughs> it was dreadful. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember uh, the terrible liturgical aberrations. Uh, I fortunately was spared actually attending a clown mass and that <laughs> type of thing. But you just knew even as a kid that no, this, this just doesn't look right, it doesn't sound right, and it doesn't feel right. And uh, one of the things that my mom, because she was in charge of communications for the diocese, and she was also in charge of what was called the Catholic Conference, which is like a, one of the, the mm -hmm. local branches of uh, the Catholic Conference in the U.S. with the U.S. bishops and all of that. So she was seeing all the documents that were coming in and working to implement uh, the, the council in a way that was as authentic as we could. Now, it was an uphill oh. battle at times. I could, yeah. I could see the frustration that she had. But you understand then what's real and what isn't, mm -hmm. what is the faith and, and what isn't. And it just felt right as a, as a child. And then there was the introduction to the sacraments. Uh, so my mom took it upon herself to make sure that I was receiving proper catechesis at home uh, to make up for what were the obvious deficiencies of the time in school and, and elsewhere. And I, I will always be very grateful for that. And, and again, it's that understanding of the faith, not that we're better than anybody else, it's just this is the faith. It was, it was very basic, it's just it's how you lived. And so it, help me then to understand even more their process of conversion. And I've, I've talked about this, that as a child of, of a convert, especially two converts, mm. be mindful of what brought them into the faith. Mm. Uh, the, the truth, the beauty, the power of what the church offers. And to be a child of that is not to take that for granted, but actually to embrace it even more. I remember Mother Angelica telling me one time um, that one of the reasons for the Journey Home program was that it helps Catholics, when they hear converts talk about coming into the church, it helps Catholics appreciate that which they often take for granted. Yes. Yeah, and, and my mom read her way into the Catholic faith. My dad saw the example of chaplains and other Catholics, and that brought him into the faith. So that combination then, as, as a cradle Catholic, you have an obligation to know the faith as best you can. Not everyone's gonna have an opportunity or even interest in studying formal theology. It's just, but that doesn't mean you, you are then allowed to not know the faith and, and to pass it on. But then the other is to recognize how it's lived, uh, that there has to be that the living of the faith in your daily life, and that was something that I saw with both of my parents. Uh, there's a danger of being brought up in a Catholic family. You can take it for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and you may, it's kind of like uh, selling a car. At some point you're trying to sell a car, but you gotta close the sale. 
<laughs> you yes. know, and so it's sometimes a person can come through the faith, do all the hoops, learn everything without even thinking about it, saying the Lord's Prayer and not even praying at the same time, saying yeah. the rosary beads. And then at some point, though, there's got to be a closed sale. Mm -hmm. Did you have a closed sale at some time? You know what I mean? At some point, you just knew and willfully had to say, yeah, this is, this is my faith. Yeah, there was a time in the 1970s, a couple of events actually. The, the, the first was uh, when I was only about three or four when my dad was diagnosed with something. He was seriously yeah. ill, uh, brought back from uh, mm -hmm. Vietnam and Korea where he'd been running mass units, like I was saying. And they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. He lost a lot of weight. Uh, he was mm -hmm. developing neurological problems. And my mom knew, had known for a number of years that there was something seriously wrong with him. Mm -hmm. So that came as a tremendous blow uh, to the family. And you realize faith is going to get you through this. Not blind faith, but this understanding of uh, suffering, of what John Paul II, St. John Paul later called the School of the Cross. Uh, I, I wish I had been old enough and he had already written it to the Sylvipigy <laughs> Dolores and, and on his document on suffering. So there was that, um, this quiet understanding that, no, the good will come from this, and em embracing that, even as a kid, and looking at did the dad, very... Did Dad communicate that attitude to you during the he was always, struggle? He was always very patient. Yeah. Uh, now, part of the disease is that it, it, it sort of cripples you in a lot of different yeah. ways. But the strength of my mother to hold hmm. all of that together, and she did it uh, through prayer and her love of the Eucharist. So there, there comes a point where you're asking the question, all right, we're, we're going to Mass, uh, not just every Sunday, but we're, I mean, we're going to Mass, <laughs> and what does it mean? Is this real? And it, it, you have to, if you're gonna be honest with yourself, you have to answer that question. Yeah. And I answered it affirmatively because I could see the impact uh, on my mom, I could see the impact on my dad, but I could also see just the, the, the beauty and power of the sacrament in transforming us uh, through the sacrament of penance, uh, and then, of course, being worthy then to receive the Eucharist. For, to have that understanding of the real presence of the Eucharist, uh, that for me was, was the, the key moment. And then figuring out, okay, I need to know a lot more than I do right now yeah. about Christ, about the sacraments, especially about the Eucharist, but also about this thing of the church and, and the Pope. And as somebody who had a lifelong love from the earliest age of history, hmm. church history became especially significant hmm. to me. And I've been writing about it now for 30 some odd years. <laughs> and to know the history, well, well, Newman said it so well, to be yeah. deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. So it occurred to me that if, if I'm gonna be deep in history, <laughs> I have to be Catholic. But also to understand that the scandals and the crises and the challenges that the, the church has always faced, and yet here we are 2,000 years later. And, and that was very telling to me too, that, that if you study the history of the world, institutions rise and fall, empires rise and fall, ideologies rise and fall, but the church is always here. How is that possible? And you begin to appreciate then the divine aspects, the, the divine reality of the church. When Newman made that statement to become deep in, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. He, he very creatively didn't say it necessarily made you Catholic, uh, but if you're honest in your study of history, you recognize the the longevity of the church, the beauty of the church, as well as the divisions and, and all the such. But you can you can read history always through some kind of a lens mm -hmm. of your prejudice to interpret every little bitty step of history in a different way. Yes. You can do that. That's right. And I was able to, thanks to my mom, to, in, in right. some ways to live through some of the history. Uh, in 1978, uh, I was, what was I, barely 10 or however old I was. And Paul VI dies, and here we are all the way in Hawaii, <laughs> and the impact of the death of Paul VI just on the diocese where we lived, where my mom was working, uh, it was weeks of, of effort on my mom's part uh, for press releases and to organize things uh, to help Bishop Scanlon in 
as everyone moved toward this conclave. And then, we, of course, we have John Paul I, who's pope for barely a month. Yeah. And I always remember my mom was uh, calling Bishop Scanlon, who was in Ireland, because he would go home every summer for his vacation, and screaming into the phone, because the, old, the way the phones used to work, no, the pope is dead. And Bishop Scanlon, I could hear him on the other end with his, his Irish eyes, well, I know that. <laughs> we buried him already. <laughs> she says, no, John Paul I is dead. And silence at the other end. And then comes this Colossus of John Paul II. Mm -hmm. And I mention that because you're, you're witnessing history, the, the first non-Italian pope in 400 and some years, but you realize that something had happened of immense significance in the history of the church. And you were talking about a lens. So John Paul II brings us uh, what, what Benedict XVI so beautifully termed the hermeneutics. Yeah. Hermeneutics of uh, reform and continuity, Continuity. or are we talking about a hermeneutic of rupture? We had lived through this period of rupture. Yeah. I, I saw it myself as a child. But then suddenly we have John Paul II who has this hermeneutic of reform and continuity. and developing as I was very slowly as a kid, this understanding of church history, you begin to see these great movements of reform in the life of the church. In the same way that all of us have to have, be part of, and in our own lives, to be a, in a constant process of reform and, and spiritual renewal. And so for me, it was a, a, a very profound moment in my own faith development. And that was, that was one of those turning points too for me. You know, and I, <clears throat> I look at where you've come, Matt, in your writing, and your uh, your influence in a good way in you know, with EWTN and the news so. and, and all of that. I mean, and I see the shape of that from your mother and your father. You yeah. know, and praise God. Yes. At that time, uh, your mother could have been jaded because of her influence. I was thinking about this. You, there you are in '78, um, aware of what's going on beside your mother as the as the conclaves are happening, mm -hmm. and she probably knew half the players from her time in Germany. <laughs> a few of them, yeah. You know I what I'm saying? She knew yes, some yes, of them exactly. and where they were coming from, and right. some of those Germans were having to, trying to have a big influence on, <laughs> on those uh, times, during the, those times. With our time left here for the program, uh, boy, there's so much I'd love to talk to you more about your own journey and stuff. I want to back off just a little bit. Lean a little bit on your historical studies. Yeah. Your, your, um, position in the news for EWTN, mm -hmm. also your awareness of now looking back the last 50, 60 mm -hmm. years from your mother's. Talk to us about the time we're in right now in the church, because I, I guess there's some people out there who wonder, wait a second, what's he think about what's going on right now? Yes, it is uh, without question that this is a very difficult time in the life of the church. Uh, we had this catastrophe strike us in 2001, 2002 uh, with the sex abuse crisis. But as our research, as anyone knows now, that the roots of that stretch back some decades. They, they stretch back into the 50s, but especially into the 60s and 70s. So a lot of the problems that emerged out of that era of the council, we can say, I won't say that it's purely the cause of the sex abuse crisis, but what was it that the, the, the late great Richard John Newhouse said, what is the solution to this? Fidelity, fidelity, fidelity. <laughs> that had we been faithful all the way along uh, to the documents of the council, to everything that, that, that we're called to be as Catholics, I think we would be having a very different conversation now. And that's a context and that's a historical background that I think we need to, to remember. That the solutions to our problems are right in front of us. Yeah. Uh, that fidelity, that faithfulness to what we're called to be by Christ uh, is the solution to that. And so instead of abandoning uh, authority in the church, instead of trying to destroy the authority of bishops, we're called to pray for them, to encourage them, to exhort them, teach, govern, and sanctify mm -hmm. with clarity, with courage, with transparency. And that has always in the history of the church been the solution. And the great reforming movements that I was talking about that I studied as a kid and, and have, have made, I'm, I'm honored to say, so much part of my life as, as a writer, that when we look at those movements of reform, we can go back to the 11th century when Pope Leo IX showed up at the, Saint Leo IX showed up at the gates of Rome dressed as a pilgrim, barefoot with a, with a pilgrim staff and launched a reform that included Gregory VII, that included St. Peter Damien. 
You have Paul III uh, in the middle of the 16th century, who was a rather besotted Renaissance cardinal, but who completely turned his life around and became one of the greatest of our popes who brought us the Council of Trent and then surrounded himself again with great reformers. The reform movements are always there. It's St. You know, Gregory I the Great said, Semper Ecclesia Reformanda, the church is always reforming. And we then as Catholics have an obligation to help that reform movement. But we always have to remember that it's reform, not revolution. Okay. That it is by being faithful to the church, by welcoming everyone into the church, uh, that real reform can take place. So it, it's a source of frustration, I know, for many people. And this is a cross for many people. But fidelity will get us through this. I wonder if you're a study of history, what do you think about this? Um, we look at Trent, we look at Vatican I. We know from history that after every council there was a time of upheaval. As, yes. Again, as the gathering of bishops and their decisions were then distributed and then implemented. But what was unique about Vatican II is the media. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, different than any council that ever existed, Nicaea, is that immediately, even in some ways clandestinely, <laughs> yes. stuff that was happening in the council is immediately available to people at home. So what part did the media play to the bad implementation of Vatican II? A very significant one. Uh, we can look at this idea of good guys versus bad guys, of the evil uh, conservatives versus the progressives who want to bring a, a fresh air into the church, uh, all of the things that we see even today. And then just a few years after the council, just three years after the council, where we see Humani Vitae, where the media was again trying to play a role. Uh, but what we also saw was someone like Pope Paul VI, who dedicated so much of his time, life, and energy uh, to implementing the council as it was supposed to be, and then issuing something like Humani Vitae that reaffirms the teachings of the church. It took how many years? Almost 50 years for Paul to be proven absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, that, that everything he predicted would take place as a result of the embrace of this sort of contraceptive culture, what John Paul II later called the culture of death, all of it has come to pass. So if, if you have any sort of a sense of history, you know that Paul VI was right, that the popes, especially in the 20th century, about all the isms were right. So if that's the case, then there has to be something else there uh, in their teachings. And so, so start with those teachings. Yeah. Understand what Paul was warning us about and what John Paul II was talking about. Because John Paul II warned that at the end of the 20th century, there were these grave, dire threats to the dignity of the human person. Now in the 21st century, exactly as he predicted, we're arguing over the very definition of what a human person is. And that wisdom of the popes now needs to be heard more than ever. And only in the church will you have that wisdom. Yeah, the media is an interesting uh, animal. Uh, and you're very, we're very much, but you even 10 times more than me. I know I've said this on the journey home, I've joked that uh, it used to be in the years and years and years ago, when, when somebody coined a joke in Boston, the only way it would make it to LA is if it was a really good joke. Yes. Because it, it had to go from person to person to person to person to person. To per then with the newspapers, it might make it a little quicker. Today, you coin a joke in Boston, and it's in L.A. before. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, with Twitter, it's, it can, you can tell a joke in Boston, and in five seconds, it's in Singapore. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> right. so the good and the bad of that. That's right. The, the immediacy of news today is something that, as Catholics, we have to be very much aware of. And, and the Second Vatican Council saw that. There was a, a somewhat forgotten document called Intermorifica that talked about all the means of social communications. Paul used scrolls and sandals and the Roman road system uh, to communicate the truth and beauty of the, of the faith. Today, we have to embrace everything. That includes social media, that includes, there's still a place for print, there's television, radio, but especially what Benedict calls the digital continent. Yeah. And we have to be savvy, we have to be clever, but we have to be professional. And what we do has to be reliable for people. They have to know that when they come to us for news, for example, that what they're getting is, what is the Catholic lens on something? Because we, we will have a, a, a way of looking at it that no one else will. And it's a way, actually, that will help you improve your life. Uh, because we're asking the big question, but we're also trying to orient you toward your eternal destiny uh, as well. 
Yeah, and I, I really I hadn't planned for this to be an infomercial, but uh, I really do want us to take a time and talk about the importance of EWTN mm -hmm. in this in your life. In the and I, I was thinking about one of the dangers. I mean, the media is a gift from God, but the devil's very active yes. and will twist. Um, and I've always felt that, that the strategies of the devil is that when 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 God tries to do something through someone first thing the devil wants to do is stop it. But if he can't stop it, then he ridicules it mm -hmm. or you know, does all kinds of things. But eventually, he then decides, well, the easiest way is to flood the market. Mm -hmm. So there's so many voices that you can't tell which one, like how many Bibles are there out there right now, how many churches are there out there right now, which is the right church, how many opinions out there. And the internet, of anything, has just done that in spades. Oh, yes. So and it, it, there's an egalitarianism such that uh, here you have someone with great renown and influence and intellect uh, writing some, of the, and here's somebody over here, and they're they're treated treated equally in this great soup of voices. So how do you know? Well, sometimes it's more than a soup; it's almost a toxic waste dump, uh, depending <laughs> upon, and everybody starts melting. Yeah. Uh, no, you're absolutely right, and and part of it is. A word that I know that uh, my mom used uh, that, that she embraced as she was reading her way into the faith, and that's discernment and forming your conscience. Now, we all have to act on our conscience, but we still have to form it right. So part of it starts with going to places that are solid, reliable, very clear in, in what they're offering, and EWTN does that. Yeah. Uh, and part of the, the, the genius of Mother Angelica, and, and then the, the, the genius moving forward, especially under someone like Michael Warsaw, is developing all of these different platforms for news uh, that people yeah. can turn to, and programs like this one, uh, where people know you can always go and find resources that will answer your questions. Uh, the part of the problem we have in, in the, the consumption of news today is that we have a lot of questions, but we don't have very reliable answers. And the, the answers themselves tell you a lot about where you're going, mm -hmm. but how you decide on what answers you're going to follow uh, it requires discernment, it requires patience, uh, but it also requires having access to things that are reliable. Mm -hmm. And you know in your gut, like my mom did, there's something here that's reliable. This is, this is what I've been looking for. And, and that's where I think uh, news from a Catholic perspective is so important. Yeah, yeah. and I think about all the programming of EWTN, including this program, uh, a real commitment to be, make sure we're faithful so that the home audience knows that when they turn on any program on, mm -hmm. it's faithful, it's trustworthy. Um, certainly we have ind independent uh, hosts like me that can push a button once in a while or, or push sure. the envelope a little bit, but there's always the, 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 the trustworthiness of the channel to make sure that we're faithful to the church. And I think the addition of the National Catholic Register was a great addition to the whole package. I, I, well, it's uh, one of the greatest privileges of my life, and I mean that seriously, <laughs> to be able to work for the Register. This idea that you can bring in a newspaper and then you have all of these other ways of integrating it uh, is fantastic but it's also counterintuitive today because most people are dispensing with with publications and newspapers no you there's a place for print uh, but there's also a place for a digital presence for the register which uh, is is growing very rapidly but there's one other thing too and this is sort of the parting thing joy we have to have that joy as Catholics, we have to have that joy as followers of Christ, and that is something else that can penetrate so much of the gloom today that we yeah. have in the world. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes people almost feel like, well, it's, it's so horrible that we, it would be disrespectful to be joyful. <laughs> <laughs> we need that, but it's a gift of grace too. Yes, the joy of the early Christians in the face of, of horrendous persecutions. Uh, the joy of, the, well, we just uh, had recently the beatification of the Algerian martyrs. Uh, the joy of that community uh, was contagious, and, and that will live on forever. But it's also inviting, it's winsome. Uh, it, it's one of the ways that we can bring people to the faith uh, and start that conversation with them. You've written a bazillion books, 54 books. 
um, if the audience says, boy, I, I'd like to read something by Matt, what would you recommend? All your books. Uh, I'd say the Encyclopedia of American Catholic History, for one, uh, because I think it's a story filled with a lot of converts, Elizabeth Ann Seton, Demetrius Galitzin, uh, Dorothy Day. I mean, we, there's a list uh, that is vast in there. Of That's the next time you come back to the journey home, you're going to go through all those folks, Let's too. Let's do it. Because we need to do it. I'd love uh, to. Matt, thank you so much. Real joy to be with for you. For joining me and also for all the work you do for EWTN. You're a great gift to us. Likewise. And we appreciate and, uh, it very much. All of your viewers and those who are considering coming into the faith, that you were genuinely in my prayers. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I hope that Matt's story about his, the conversion of his, his parents as well, his own journey in the church, was an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.